Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Live with Lon. We're so glad to have you, and um, thanks for tuning in this week. We're going to be continuing in our study of the Gospel of John. We're going to finish up chapter four today after a number of weeks in this amazing chapter. So, are you ready? All right, here we go. Let's pray. And let's take a minute to um, confess our sins and ask the Lord to cleanse our heart and get us ready to hear his word. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a loving and forgiving God. Thank you, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, accept our confession this morning. In response, Lord, to our humility before you and our confession, uh, Lord, forgive us, cleanse us. Uh, may the channel be open between you and us. May the Holy Spirit uh, be able to communicate uh, deeply and effectively the truth of God's word to us today, and may it be life-changing uh, for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, what'd you say? Amen and amen. Okay. Well, um, very exciting chapter we've been in, John chapter 4, but we're going to finish it today, and we're going to get ready to move on to John chapter 5. Here at the end of John chapter 4 is a magnificent healing that Jesus did, which often um, is not really taught. It kind of is a little hidden healing, so to speak, here in the end of John chapter 4, but it's magnificent. So, are you ready? And just before we dig in, let me remind you that on our website, my uh, trip to uh, the Holy Land in October of 2022 is posted, as well as our trip this spring uh, to the footsteps of St. Paul. So I hope that you will look at those and join us for one of these biblical tours after all this COVID stuff. Friends, it's time to get out and travel again. Praise the Lord. If you have any questions, give me a call. Now, a little bit of context. The Lord Jesus Christ has gone up to Jerusalem. We read about this in uh, chapter 2 of John's Gospel for the Feast of Passover. And while he was there in John chapter 3, he met our good friend Nicodemus. And he talked to Nicodemus about the plan of salvation. And if you missed any of those messages, man, you got to go back and listen to them. They're, they're amazing out of John chapter 3. And then we've been in John chapter 4, where Jesus met the woman at the well. What an amazing encounter, and also met the people of the village of Sychar and had a massive revival there. Again, you need to go back and catch up if you miss those. And today we're going to finish out John chapter 4. So, are you ready? All right, here we go. John chapter 4, of course, using the New American... <laughs> no, it's not using the New King James version of the Bible. What do I always say? We're live. There we go. All right. Let's begin John chapter 4, verse 43. Now, after the two days, he, did Jesus, departed from there, from Sychar, and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. You say, I don't, I don't fully get that. He had massive honor there in Sikkar. Just about the whole town came to Christ. Yes, that's not what this is referring to. It's referring to a little bit before this, 
where Jesus decided to leave Jerusalem because the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the rabbis were out to get him. Even after he had done a massive amount of signs and miracles there in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. And that's what he's referring to, that he had no honor in his own country. Remember, he was in Samaria here. Samaria is not his own country. Judea is. And so he had left Judea, Jerusalem specifically, and was now headed up back north to the Sea of Galilee, where his headquarters was for his public ministry. All right, now, here we go. Verse 45, then when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Capernaum is about 20 miles from Cana. Capernaum was really Jesus' headquarters, but he came to Cana on the way going to Capernaum, where, of course, he turned water into wine. And this nobleman, obviously a Jewish guy, had heard he arrived in Cana and sent to him uh, because this nobleman had a problem. Let's look at it. Verse 47, and when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. It's interesting that the Bible here says come down and heal his son because Cana's up in the hill country of Galilee, Capernaum's right down 600 feet uh, below sea level uh, at the uh, uh, right there along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So this topographically is an incredibly accurate statement. Now, what did the nobleman want? Well, his son was sick. We learn later he had a horrible fever and was on the verge of dying. And he wanted Jesus to come and to heal his son. Very reasonable request. In fact, it meant so much to him that he actually went to Jesus personally to ask for this favor. So what does Jesus say? Verse 48, then Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that the Jews seek after a sign. Okay, Jesus acknowledges this here. And you know, he doesn't condemn this. I mean, when I was coming to Christ, I asked God to heal my dog. I figured if, if God couldn't handle healing a dog, then what good was he? I, I don't mean that disrespectfully, uh, but I wanted to see uh, some expression of God's power uh, before I believed. Well, this nobleman didn't come because he wanted to believe. He came because he had a sick child. But Jesus understands that the ultimate end of this is he'd like to see this man and his family come to belief in Christ. And so this is what he says to him. Now, verse 49, and the nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Did Jesus agree to go to his house? No. Did Jesus even discuss with him going to his house? No. Jesus said, go your way, go back home, your son's going to live. So, the nobleman has a choice. He could stay there and argue with Jesus and say, no, 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 no. You got to come with me. No, please. Uh, and beg him. Or he could believe Jesus, turn around and go home. 
Look at the Bible. Here we go. Verse 50. And the man, the nobleman, believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. My dear friends, this is exactly the best definition of faith I know. We believe the word that Jesus speaks to us. Believe in me and you'll have eternal life. I believe that. Trust in what I did for you on the cross and your sins will be paid for. I believe that. Give your heart to me and you'll never see hell or be judged by the holiness of God. I believe that. This is faith. It's like Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him, accounted to him as righteousness. But what did he believe? God told him he was going to have a son by way of Sarah, even though the odds looked impossible. What did Abraham do? He showed faith, meaning what? He believed what God told him. This is faith. Believing the word that the Lord speaks to us now, of course, through the scripture. This man, of course, had a personal encounter with Jesus and heard him speak to him directly. But God speaks to us directly today right through the scripture. Now, look at this. He believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. He headed home, believing his son was going to be well. Why? Because Jesus told him that. And as he was now going down back home to Capernaum, his servants met him on the way and told him, I'm sure with great excitement, saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of them, the nobleman did, the hour when he, the son, got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, 1 p.m., the fever left him. Now watch this, verse 53. So the father knew that it was at the same hour, 1 p.m., which Jesus said to him, in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Wow, isn't that awesome? The nobleman was standing in front of Jesus at one o'clock in the afternoon and Jesus said, your son lives, go home. The man turned around and left. And when the servants met him, he said, what time did he get better? And the servant said, 1 p.m., the fever left. Exactly when Jesus had said, your son lives. Wow. How could you not believe in Christ after this? Well, sadly, Jesus did miracles like this all over, and there were still people who didn't believe in him. How could they not? I don't know. The blindness of man is beyond comprehension. But this man had the good sense to believe in him and his whole household. Praise the Lord. Now watch, last verse. And this again is the second sign, miracle, that Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. What was the first miracle Jesus did when he came out of Jerusalem into Galilee? I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us what that one was. Maybe it was in Sychar, where he healed all these people, I believe. And the massive revival hit. Maybe that is what John is referring to. And this now was the second one after Jesus had headed home from Jerusalem. But whatever the first one was, this was the second one. Now, that's as far as we're going to go in our passage right now, because it's the end of the chapter, first of all. <laughs> and second of all, that is the end of the passage. <laughs> so we have to ask our most important question, and you know what this question is. Are you ready? Come on now. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. So what? Yes. And you know, this week, I received this from uh, a listener. How sweet it is. It's a little pouch that I can keep things in. And thank you so much 
to the person, you know who you are, who sent me this, how sweet it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. Say that with me. No, not praise the Lord. Ready? You know what to say. How sweet. Come on. It is. You bet. To be studying God's word together today. Now, what is the point of this passage? What is the message of this passage that the Holy Spirit wants to drive home to you and me? Well, I would say the message is that Jesus's power is so unlimited that he doesn't even need to be present in order to do a healing or a miracle. His authority is so massive and his power is so omnipotent that he was able to heal this boy from 20 miles away simply by speaking the word, speaking the word. That's all. Now, that being true, it reminds me of another passage uh, that we covered months ago, but I want to take us back to. It's in Luke chapter 7. It's the story of a centurion who built a synagogue in Capernaum for the Jewish people. You remember this story, I think, maybe, where the lesson is very similar. I want you to look. Let's look. Chapter 7, Luke's Gospel, verse 1. Now, when he ended all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, Jesus, and a certain centurion servant. Remember, a centurion was a Roman military officer akin to a captain in our modern army. A certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to Jesus, pleading with him, the elders, to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was worthy, for he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. By the way, that synagogue, as I told you, is still standing to this day in the excavation there in Capernaum. Go to Israel with me sometime. I'll give you a chance to stand in this very synagogue that this centurion built right here out of the Bible. You can stand in it. Now, then Jesus went with them, the rabbis, and when he was already not far from the centurion's house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but simply look at this, say the word, speak the word, and my servant will be healed. This is a Gentile, and yet his grasp on who Jesus is was so amazing. He understood the authority of Jesus, that Jesus didn't need to show up personally to do this. He understood the power of Jesus, that Jesus could just speak oh, the word and it would happen. He didn't even need to lift a pinky to make this happen. Just speak the word. And there was a logic to this centurion's statement. Look, he tells us about it in verse 8. He says, for I also am a man placed under authority. I have authority, just like you do, Jesus. And I have soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to uh, another, do this, and he does it. So what is the centurion saying? What's his logic in saying, you don't need to come under my roof, Jesus? His logic is this. I'm a Roman military officer. I have authority. And when I speak the word, I don't need to actually get up and go do it. I don't need to actually move. I speak the word to one soldier and he goes and to another one and he does it. And to another one, he goes and does whatever I ask him to. I, I, because I have authority to speak the word and some seraph, or some angel, some heavenly creature 
will come and heal my servant. You don't need to come yourself. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Some translations will say he was amazed at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. The Bible says Jesus was amazed at this guy. Now, the Greek word is the word thalmazo. And thalmazo is used a number of times in the New Testament. This is the only place, however, and you may remember I told you this, that it's ever used in a positive sense. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Jesus was amazed at their hardness of heart. But here he's amazed at this centurion for a good thing, for his faith, for his ability to trust Jesus, to simply speak the word and not require that he has to come into the house itself. And Jesus said, I haven't found anybody in all of Israel who understands me and the authority that I have, the power that I have, like this guy. It's amazing. So what's the point of all this? Friends, the point of all this is that the reason the man in John chapter 4 and the reason this centurion were able to show great faith is because they had their understanding of Jesus was accurate. They had a big understanding of how big the Lord Jesus really was and how big his authority really was and how big his power really was and is. And because in their mind, their concept of God was big, their ability to trust him and what he said, faith, their faith was able to be big. Do we see that? Having a big God leads to having a big faith. Having a little God leads to having a little faith. Now, what difference does this make for you and me? Much in every way. God wants us to have a big faith in him. Listen to what God says, Jeremiah 33, 3. He says, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. This is an invitation from God to call out to him in faith and to expect great things from him and he will exceed even what we expect. This reminds me of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, where the Bible says that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or even think, than we can ask or even imagine, some translations say. Hey, I can imagine a lot. So can you. God says, I don't care how much you can imagine. Yeah, it's nothing. I can do more than that. Wow. That's a big faith right there. And that's what God wants us to have. How do we get a big faith? Remember the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. No, uh, yeah, yes, they said that, but no, their focus was on the wrong thing. Faith is a result, not a cause. You say, what does that mean? Faith is the result of having a big concept, a big view of who God is. And when you're when you have a big God, the result is you'll be able to have a big faith. You with me? Faith is is the result. The cause is our view of God and how big it is. You say, well, how big can you? friends, you can't have a, a, a view of God that's bigger than God is. <laughs> no matter how big your view of God is, he's bigger. But he wants our understanding 
of his power and his majesty and his sovereignty and his omnipotence and his authority to grow as we grow in our faith as Christians. And as it grows, our ability to trust him, our faith will grow. You with me? Okay. Now, how do you grow your view of God? <sighs> Very simple, folks. You get to know him in the word of God. You get into the word of God. And this is one of the reasons God gave us the Bible, is to teach us who he is. Another reason is to explain to us how we get to heaven and get our sins forgiven, yes. Uh, but also to explain to us who God is and, and what his character is and how majestic and mighty he is so that we can trust him more. So, this is why Romans chapter 10 says, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's turn that around. By the word of God, we hear, and as we hear, what do we hear? We hear about the majesty of God and the great things and awesome, mighty things he's capable of doing. And as we hear, our faith becomes greater. You with me? And so this is why we read the Bible every day. This is why we study the word of God. Not because it's a legalistic requirement in the Christian community to have Bible study and Bible reading and quiet time. No, that's not why we do it. We do it so that our concept of God can be magnified and exalted and increased. And when that happens, our faith will increase all by itself. You don't have to try to increase your faith, increase the size of your God. When we read about him creating the, the world simply by speaking the word, when we read about him giving Sarah and Abraham a child when she was 90 and he was almost 100, when we read about him opening the Red Sea and then swallowing up the chariots of Pharaoh, when we read about him making the sun stand still, and when we read about him stopping the waters of the Jordan River for Joshua, and when we read about him doing all these great and awesome things that the Bible talks about, when we read about all the miracles of the Lord Jesus, which as I've told you is only one month out of 36, and he did all these things we read about in the Gospels. When we read about the book of Acts and the things the Lord did, What's that designed to do? It's designed to make us say, wow, if I got a God like that, if I've got a God that mighty, then I can trust him for big things because he is a big God. And I understand that. One of the greatest mistakes that Christians make is they limit God. They limit God. Uh, they 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 won't be they they won't trust him for great things. And why do they limit God? Because they have a limited concept of his greatness. You know, just the other day, I had this wonderful hat. I should have put it on so you could see it. I will next week. Uh, I, I got it from South Africa where it's made by people in the bush because it's the hats they wear. It's magnificent. I love it. It's it's thick leather, and it, it's just a great hat. Well, the other day, I couldn't find it, and I looked everywhere, everywhere. I even went back to some places where I had been several days before and asked them, did you find my hat? Did you find my hat? No, no, I went to CBS. I went to the UPS store. No, 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 didn't find it. And I was so sad. I love this hat. I was so sad. And I was like, oh my gosh, I looked all around the house. I asked Brendan, have you seen it? No. I got it from England where it was made by South Africans. I ordered it from England and had it shipped over. 
And once they make a certain number of these hats, they they don't make any more. So I knew I probably wouldn't be able to get another one just like the one I got. So I was driving home after going to CVS and all these places. And I remember sitting in the car at the red light and saying, you know, Lord Jesus, you know exactly where that hat is. It's somewhere. And you are mighty enough that you can lead me to that hat because you're a great God and your power is unlimited. And somehow, some way, you can show me where that hat is. Lord, please do that. You say, you really think God cares that much about where your hat is? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'm his child. And no matter how trivial something may be to, to him, running the universe, keeping Neptune from crashing into Pluto, you know how it is if you have children? If something's important to them, no matter how trivial it may be, it's important to you because they're your child. <clears throat> I've said that before, and it's true. And so all of a sudden, as I was riding back home after the red light, it hit me. So it's like the thought popped in my mind. Oh, I'll bet my hat is there. And sure enough, when I got home and went and looked, it was in a place where I don't go that often, but I had sat there to have a conversation with my son, Jamie, a couple of days before. Sure enough, I'd set it on the floor behind the chair when I sat down to talk with him. You say, ah, you'd have found it anyway. I don't know whether I would or wouldn't have, but I'm just telling you, God led me to that hat. I could trust him for that because I know he's a big God, just like I can trust him for parking spaces and I can trust him to help me find lost keys and I can help him to trust me. Uh, I can tr I can trust him to help me with just with anything. I, I, I can trust him to give us the National Wildlife Federation and to pay off a $103 million building program at McLean Bible Church, which he did before I left. Why? Because over 50 years of studying the word, the Holy Spirit has caused my view of God to expand to the point where I believe Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you know not, son. <clears throat> Just give me a chance. Don't limit me. Just give me a chance. My friend, that's what he wants from you. Get into the word. Let your view of God grow big. Let it become unlimited in your mind. And then you'll find you'll be able to trust him for anything. Now, let me just say in closing, just because you trust him for something doesn't automatically mean it's going to happen. God still has a will and a plan for your life and my life. And sometimes whatever it is we decide to trust him for doesn't fit in that plan. Men, God is not going to do it. That doesn't mean he's not big enough to. Just means it's not part of his plan. Oh, that's okay. Uh, trusting God for big things doesn't mean we always get them. It just means that we always know if it's in his plan, he can do it all. You with me? All right. So don't hold God to something that he never promised. He didn't promise just because you trusted him for it that you were automatically going to get it. He just said, call to me and I'll answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things you know not, even though it may not be exactly the thing you asked for, it'll still be great and mighty and be better for you than what you asked for. Better for you than what you asked for. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. And right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and you've got struggles in your life, I do in my life, why don't we take a minute and say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to do Jeremiah 33, 3. I'm going to call unto you. And I'm going to believe like the man in John 4. And I'm going to believe like the centurion that your power and authority is so unlimited that you can do what I'm asking you to do and exceedingly abundantly beyond even what I can imagine. So, Lord Jesus, I'm going to call on you now and trust you. Let's take a moment and do that.
Dear Lord Jesus, some of the things we just called on you to do look impossible right now. Some of the things we just called on you to do look like there's no chance on God's green earth they're ever going to happen. Like the salvation of a loved one. Uh, like uh, the coming to Christ of a mother or a father. Like uh, the res resolution of a problem that seems unsolvable. Whatever. But Lord, remind us that Gabriel told Mary that with God, nothing is impossible. So help us hold on to you and trust you, Lord, either for what we ask for or for something great and mighty that's even better. Increase the size of our God in our mind and in our spirit. And Lord Jesus, thank you that our faith will increase commensurately. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And what? Amen. Now, I had a, <laughs> a gentleman who wrote me and said, Lon, when you say at the end of your message, what was that? Preaching? Uh, it sounds kind of arrogant. Like, I was a pilot, he said. And when I landed an airplane, that would be like my coming on the speaker and saying to everybody, what was that? That was a good landing. Okay, I hear that. I don't mean it that way. I just mean there's so much in our world today that's crummy preaching, forgive me, but it just is, or worse, wrong preaching, that it's nice to hear something that's correct preaching and good preaching. So, I'm not going to say that today. I'm not going to say what was that. <laughs> but you know what it was. Praise the Lord. <laughs> God bless you. Hope to see you next week on Live with Law.